Good morning. Good morning. Happy Thursday. My name is Peter, one of the two pastors serving here at Bethany Baptist Church, one of 159 members. Because faith comes from hearing the, hearing the words of Christ. Let's open up to 1 John chapter 2. If you are new to our church and it's your first time opening up the Bible, there should be a hard black cover Bible underneath the seat in front of you. The page number is 1083. 1083. When I say chapter, that's the big number. When I say verses, those are small numbers. So we're going to be covering about 12 verses. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 to chapter 3, verse 10. So now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins. And there's no sin in him. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose to destroy the devil's works. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his, seed, because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who doesn't love his brother or sister. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We pray, we pray that you would bring clarity to your word. Fill me with your spirit for the sake of edification of Christ's body. May your word, the words of Christ, dwell richly within us, among us. <coughs> Father, we pray that you would help us to know that we have been born of him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This past weekend, from Thursday afternoon to Saturday afternoon, our church had a woman's retreat, which means that my wife was gone for the past three days, leaving me with my three young kids. Let me tell you that as one of the pastors of this church, I do declare that this is the last woman's retreat ever. <laughs> And all the husband says, Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, all jokes aside, thank you wives for what you do. The Lord sees you, the Lord knows your work, the help and the aid that you provide for your husbands. 
This past weekend was actually very discouraging for me because I got to see my sin up close, more up front than other weekends because my wife was gone and I was just hanging out with my three kids. I just didn't know how hard it was, uh, not babysitting my kids, but spending time with my kids. Many times I raised my voice. I, I raised my voice towards my kids. I was sinfully angry many times. I sinfully grumbled as I fixed up their meals and as they woke me up and as I cleaned the house. And at the end of the day, I come, maybe as you're coming, discouraged by my sin. I feel discouraged, sad, and angry with myself because of my sins. I feel dirty. I feel ashamed. Sin is discouraging. And many of you may feel this way. And this message is for you. For those struggling in your sin. If you're taking notes, the main goal of today's text is know that you are born of God. Know that you are born of God. Two, two ways that you know that you are born of God. First, by remaining in Him. That's Jesus. And second, by letting no one deceive you. So main goal, know that you are born of God. Two ways, by remaining in Him and by letting no one deceive you. Let's go to the first way, by remaining in Him. How can you know that you are born of God? First, by remaining in Him. The question is, what does it mean to remain in Him? I mean, you've maybe grown up in the church and you've heard that phrase before. Abide in Christ, remain in Christ, be in Christ, continue to walk in Christ. What does that actually mean? If you were to turn to your Bibles to John chapter 15, it gives you a fuller picture or a better angle into what it means to remain in Jesus. He gives us a picture, vine and branches. Remain in the vine, you branches, and you will bear much fruit. Yes. So what does it mean to remain in Christ? It means to abide. It means to be attached in Christ. That is, receive and trust in Christ. Continue to look to Christ. So remaining in Christ is a good summary statement concerning how a Christian ought to live. It's walking as Jesus walked, continuing to keep His commands. It also means that the Holy Spirit abides in you, remains in you, lives in you, indwells you. So, born of God people, remain in Jesus. Christians, you are commanded and you do remain in Jesus. But from the text today, there are three reasons why you ought to remain in Jesus. Three reasons why you ought to remain in Jesus. First reason, because for your confidence. Second reason, for your confirmation. Third reason, for your conformity. So confidence, confirmation, conformity. Those are the three reasons why you ought to remain in Jesus. That's why you ought to walk in the light. That's why you ought to abide and be attached to the vine for your confidence, for your confirmation, and for your conformity. First reason, for your confidence. Look down with me to verse 28. So now, little children, the command here is, remain in Him. Purpose? So that when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Friends, what is the result? What is the purpose of remaining and walking in Christ? It is so that you may be found confident at the appearance of Jesus. Why are we confident? Our confidence doesn't come from our works, nor our own righteousness, nor what we have, accompli what we have accomplished, but by the fact that we remain 
and abide in Jesus. What are we confident of when Jesus appears? What are you confident of when Jesus appears? The fact that you were reading the Bible when Jesus appeared? The fact that you were kneeling down and praying to the Lord when, you, when Jesus appeared? What is the basis of your confidence? Christians, you ought to be confident when Christ appears. When you think about the second appearance of Jesus, you should be confident. But your confidence does, does not come from your own righteousness. You are going to be confident because He will accept you and not deny you. You are confident that He will say at the end of the day that you are His and that He is yours. You are confident that, the Jesus, that Jesus our Lord will say, I know Him. He is mine. He belongs to me. Matthew 7 says, it's a sobering and it's a passage that makes me tremble every time I think about it. It says, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do wonders and miracles? But Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of evil. Saints, there will be those who are confident and there will be those who are ashamed. Those who are shrinking back. I wonder how you would feel if Jesus appeared today. If Jesus came back today, will you be ashamed or will you be confident? Think about that often. But your confidence shouldn't come from your unblemished acts or your own righteousness, but that of remaining in Christ. So remain in Jesus for your confidence. Second reason, for your confirmation. Second reason why you want to remain in Jesus is for your confirmation. The text says that those who does what is right, that's in verse 29, has been born of him. But the reordering of that sentence in verse 29 is also true. Those who have been born of God do what is right. If you are born of God, you do what is right. If you do what is right, you are born of God. Meaning, if you are born of God, then you will continue to do what is right, which means to remain in Him. You don't just do one thing right, but you continue to do what is right because that's who you are. That's the distinction. Friends, sin will find you. When someone says that they have become a Christian, just right now, one of the pastors that I know of will sometimes say, oh, you've become a Christian. Praise God. And the next statement is, sobering and it raises my eyebrows but I think it's true he says time will tell when you say I've become a Christian I believe in Christ one of the pastors that I know says praise God time will tell yes time will tell because it becomes evident whether you're a Christian or not because if you are a Christian you've been given a new nature and a new heart which means Something oozes, oozes out of you from your new nature, from your new heart. So it will become evident. So remain in Jesus, continue to remain in Him for your confirmation. Confirmation of the fact that you are born of Him. Third reason, and the last reason, is for your conformity. Let's look down to verses 1 and 2. And let me read that one more time. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. See 
what great love the Father has given us. That we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. Verse 1 starts with the command, Behold, see. See the Father's love that has been given to you, Christians. What kind of love is that? How do we know that the Father loves us? The fact that you are called God's children. Saints, you and I were once enemies of Christ. When we were once enemies of Christ, He made us His children. How? He first calls us His children, and we are His children. He has called you to be His child, and now you are in reality. You've been given a new nature by virtue of you being his child. And it continues to say, and it seems a little confusing to me when I first read it. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. And the next phrase is a little confusing. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. My question as I was reading the text is, what's the relationship between the reason why the world doesn't know us and the fact that God loves us and we are His children? I don't really get the relationship there. How I reconcile the, that tension there is, um, I immigrated from South Korea when I was in the fourth grade. When I first came, it was wild. Out of maybe two or three hundred elementary student, student kids, I think I was the one of two Koreans in the school. And I had been brought up in a culture where it was normal for guys to hold hands. That was the culture when I grew up in, in Korea. But when I came here, that was weird. <laughs> And I didn't understand why. I mean, I stopped holding hands with guys because that was weird because that's the culture that I was living in. But when I went back to Korea a year later and I saw guys holding hands that are my age, I was engrossed by it. You see, the point is, when you become a child of God, what you do and how you live your life doesn't make sense to the world. This is the statistics um, according to Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is a, um, a defense system in the web to help you fight against pornography. Stats coming from Covenant Eyes says 90% of teens and 96% of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about porn with their friends. That's 90% of teenagers, 96% of young adults. How, how do we think of that as Christians? If we were to talk about how we view the, the porn industry or masturbation or fight with lust, People will raise their eyebrows and say, what kind of world do you live in? Yes, the reason why the world doesn't know us is because we're not of the world. If the world sees you and understands you, there's something wrong. Tremble, be alert, because the world shouldn't understand us because we have a nature that is so different, radically different from the devil's children, the nature that they have inherited. So yes, the reason why the world doesn't know us is because the world doesn't know God or Jesus. And it continues in verse 2. Not only are we called God's children, 
We are. We are God's children now. And it says, there's a future promise here. We will be. We will be. What we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, when Jesus comes again, we will be like him. Because we will see him as he is. The third reason why you ought to remain in Jesus is for you to conform to the image of Christ. Can you think about anybody who saw God and changed? Who is it? Think about in the Old Testament who saw God and maybe his face was shining. Yes, his name is Moses. There's something radically different about someone who sees God. Even physical appearance. When Moses sees God on Mount Sinai, even the back of God, and he comes down, his face is shining bright and people are trembling. So he has to wear a veil over his face so that people don't tremble, so that people won't um, back away because they're fearing uh, the holiness or the purity of Moses. When we see God, we change from one degree of glory to another. Saints, we don't see Jesus right now as we ought to, but one day we will. That's a hope that we have. We will one day see Jesus as he is, and we will be like him. So third reason why we ought to remain in Jesus is for your confirmation. Now let's go to the second way of Knowing to know that we are born of Him. So first way of uh, knowing that we are born of God was to remain in Jesus, by remaining in Him. Second way is by letting no one deceive you. That's in verse 7. Look down with me to verse 7. It's just the first sentence of verse 7. It says, little children... Let no one deceive you. Yes. That's a command there. Let nobody deceive you. So the second way you may know that you are born of God is by letting no one deceive you. There are different um, presuppositions to that phrase, let no one deceive you. There is the deceiver. There is the one who's deceived. And lastly, there is the notion of being led astray from the truth. I mean, think about the fall, right? There is a serpent. There's the mankind, and there's the lie that's uttered by the serpent. No, surely you won't die. You see, in, in, the, in the notion of the phrase, let no one deceive you, there's at least three presuppositions. There's a deceiver, there's the deceived, and there's being led astray from the truth. And God is commanding us to not to be deceived. Christians, do not be deceived but believe. Do not be deceived, but believe. Two things that you need to believe. First, is coming from verse five. Look down with me to verse five. Verse five says, you know that he was revealed, that's Jesus. Jesus was revealed so that he might take away sins and there is no sin in him. So don't be deceived, but believe. First, believe that sinless Jesus was revealed to take away sins. Do you remember the phrase that Apostle, uh, not Apostle, John the Baptist used in the Gospel of of John? Behold, the Lamb of God. What is the purpose? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Christmas message, isn't it? The Christmas message is that Jesus came, he appeared, he was revealed. What's what's the purpose? To take away, to take away the sins. The ultimate human problem is not politics, not gender confusion, not single parent families, not poverty, not illiteracy, not lack of education. The ultimate problem for mankind is 
sin. And to take away that problem, Jesus came 2,000 years ago. And friends, all of our beliefs have ramifications, consequences to our beliefs. The ramifications are that there are those who sin, whose sins have been taken away, and those whose sins haven't been. Meaning, there are those who are His and those who aren't His. So if we were to believe sinless Jesus came to take away sins, the ramification of that belief is that there are those whom Jesus took away their sins for, and there are those whose sins have not been taken away. That's the ramification of that belief. Verse, verses 3 and 6 mention the ones whose sins have been taken away, those who are born of God. So there are those who are born of God and those who aren't born of God. Verse 3, it talks about purity. You can look down and see it. It talks about everyone who has his hope purifies himself just as he is pure. Just as God is pure, his children are also pure. Look, without looking at the text, just look at me here. Answer this question, Christian. What makes us pure? Who makes us pure? Who is it? Okay. Jesus makes us pure. Yes, that's true. His righteousness. There are textual grounds to believe that it is Jesus alone who purifies us, or Jesus who purifies us. That is biblically correct answer. But now look down at the text, specifically verse 3. Everyone who has this, what is it? Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies Himself. That's amazing, isn't it? Saints, your hope purifies you. The hope that you have in Christ purifies you currently. But let me ask you this, Christians. When do you feel pure? When do you actually feel like you are holy and pure? Maybe when you're reading your Bible. When you, maybe when you're having a good week. Maybe when you've found um, a pattern of prayerfulness, a turn of heart, a resolve, an action plan of defeating a particular sin, following through with the resolution to root out sin for an extended period of time. You've been wanting to read your Bible and you have been reading your Bible. You have been wanting to be more prayerful, and you have been more prayerful. That's when you feel like you are pure, don't you? But God says, not these actions, but your hope purifies you. What is hope? Hope is looking to the future. But it's not merely looking to the future. It's expecting and desiring something in the future. Like... Some of you may want to buy a house in California, expecting and desiring something in the future. But the funny thing is, your expectation and your desire of something in the future actually changes the present, how you live your life. How so? Well, let's talk about that example. Your hope to buy a home kind of squeezes how you spend your money right now. It changes your priorities, whether to eat out or not, whether to buy a Tesla or not. Hope seems like a fickle word, but it changes the present, what's happening currently. And what is the object of that hope in verse 3? It says, this hope in Him. The, the object of that hope is the hope of conforming to the image of Christ. That hope purifies us. So, saints, if you put your hope in becoming like Christ, if you say, I hope to become like Christ, I hope one day I will see Christ, that hope purifies you currently. And the question for you is, what are your hopes and dreams? What are you ultimately hoping? Do you hope in 
getting out of the dark tunnel that you have been in? Do you hope to, you're in a particular season, but you want to get out of that season? Are you hoping to conform to the image of Christ? Do you hope to see Him? What we hope may reveal an idol that's hidden under our circumstances and even our tears. But not only does a person born of God have this hope that purifies himself, in verse 6, it says that he does not sin. Look down to verse 6. Verse 6 says, Everyone who remains in him does not sin. What? Apostle John, you wrote that? John, are you serious? How can you say that everyone who has been born of God don't sin? Back up, dude. You gotta mean something else when you say people don't sin. It doesn't make sense. And I'm not gonna try to make a sense of that right now. I'm gonna come back to it to explain it when I explain verse nine. But we're gonna move on for now. But let that sentence stand for now. He who is born again does not sin. So he, he who is born again hopes and he does not sin. So there's two groups, right? Born of him and those who aren't born of, born of him. Those who are born of him hopes and those who are born of him doesn't sin. Those who aren't born of him commit sin and he has not seen him or known him. That's according to verse four and six. They practice lawlessness according to verse four, which means that they have not seen him or known him. What is lawlessness? Those who commit sin practice lawlessness. What is lawlessness? Lawlessness is living as though your own ideas are superior to God's. There is God's law, but your ways are higher than his. Lawlessness says, God demands it, but I don't prefer it. I will go with what I prefer. God says, do not fornicate, but since I prefer it, I will go with it. But lawlessness has another angle to it. It also deals with God's promises. God promises it, but I don't want it. Jesus is with the Samaritan woman at the well, talking about the living water. Living water that quenches the thirst. But I don't want that. I don't want the living water that quenches the thirst. People not wanting it is also a form of lawlessness. A lawlessness is rebellion and rejection against God's right to rule over us. And sin is lawlessness. So those who are born of God rebel and reject God's right to rule over them. What, God's, what God demands and promises, those who aren't born of God refuse and reject. And this means that those who aren't born of God do not know Him, and they have not seen Him. If you read through the rest of 1 John, it has that theme of seeing the eternal life. Knowing Jesus. So there is a, it, it's not great. Those who know him, those who see him are Christians. Those who, who don't know him, those who have not seen him are not born again. <coughs> but saints, I want you to be encouraged because you who have been born of God do know him. You have seen him in a sense. And you have this hope. And in one sense, you don't sin. So take heart. Don't be deceived by the lies of the enemy and the indwelling sin. You are born of God, which means sinless Jesus appeared to take away your sins. Yes, he came 2,000 years ago to take away your sins. Friends, if you're not a Christian, he did not come to take away your sins, at least at presently. But he did come 
and he did die. The question is why? Why did he die? The bad news is all, everyone sitting here, we are sinners by nature and we sin. When we wake up, we sin. When we sleep, we sin. When we walk, we sin. We reject and we rebel against God. You might say, friend, I have no beef with God. He and I are good. I believe in Him. But in fact, you aren't good with God unless you trust in Christ. Unless you supremely treasure Christ. Christ is the only one who lived a righteous and perfect life and He died on the cross for our sins. So friend, the only way to be forgiven and to be reconciled to God is by trusting and believing in Christ. So repent. Repent and believe in Christ today so that you can be forgiven. So that you can say confidently, I am born of God. I have received a new nature because I belong to Christ. I am a Christian. Let's go to the second belief and the last belief. So don't be deceived, but believe in two things. The last belief is, is a division. This is from verses 7 through 10. The division between those who are born of God and those who aren't born of God are stark and it's discernible. Let's read the verses 7 through 10. I'm going to read from the second part of verse 7. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is, what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. In verses 7 through 10, there is a progression of ideas. First idea in verses 7 through 8, it's talking about the concept of like father, like son. You do what is right, just as God is righteous. So if you are born of God, you will do what is right because that's who your father is. It's like um, if I were to stand in front of a stranger and have Ezra, who is my firstborn son, in front of me, and then I have Key in front of me, and I tell them, who do you think is my kid? It's obvious as to who my kid is because Ezra is me and I am him, in one sense. Because not only does he look like me, he smiles like me. Not only does he smile like me, he talks like me. My nature and me as who I am has been imprinted on him. Like father, like son. You do what is right, just as God, your Father, is righteous. So we know who your daddy is by how you live your life. But on the other hand, you commit sin, you are acting like your father, the devil. Now you might have questions. What about when I sin as a Christian? Does that mean at that moment, my father is of the devil? I don't think so. because we're born of God. We can't be born of God and born of the evil one at the same time as a person. I mean, we do have two natures. That's the divine nature that we share, the new nature that we receive, and the flesh, fleshly nature. But as a Christian, we are born of God, not born of the devil. 
So it's a little confusing. There, these seemingly contradicting statements and ideas are fleshed out in verse 9. I told you there's a, a progression of ideas. The first idea is like father, like son. And it goes up in verse 9. In the second part of verse 8, not verse 9, John progresses toward the reason why Jesus came. Jesus appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Do you remember the first gospel promise in Genesis 3? Which is one of the verses that we read, or Sammy read. That's Genesis 3, 15. The enmity between woman's offspring and the offspring of the serpent. And the promised one is serpent head crusher. Yes, his heel will be bruised, but he will end up crushing the head of the serpent. And one of the devil's work is to deceive. Do you remember the Garden of Eden? How the serpent came, the most cunning animal came, and starts to question, give doubt. Did God really say? And then in verse 4, what does it say? When, when Eve is like, hmm, I don't really know. I don't really know if God really said that. I think this is what God said. And then in verse 4, serpent lies straight up. He says, no, surely you won't die. No, God is withholding good from you. He is the bad guy. I'm the good guy here. I'm giving you the tip that you actually need for your life's fulfillment. Believe in me, not the words of your creator. He says, you will die? No, surely you're not going to die. No, he's withholding good from you because when you eat from this tree, you will be like God. But isn't it funny? Because in Genesis 2, when God created in Genesis 1 and 2, he makes them according to whose likeness? In God's likeness. So God already created mankind according to his image, his likeness. They are like God. But the serpent comes and distorts and deceives. No, you're not like God. But I know a way for you to be like God. The serpent comes to deceive. And one of one of the ways that Jesus came is to destroy that work. In Jesus, the danger of his children being deceived like Adam and Eve isn't possible. So saints, you ultimately won't be deceived if you are born of God. Because Jesus secures his children. He protects us from the deception of the serpent. So that's verse 8. So there's progression, and then now verse 9. Let's look down and follow along as I read from verse 9. This is a tricky passage or verse. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. Now let's, let's talk about the reason first. There's two reasons here, right? Because he, is not able, he's, he does not sin because his seed... <coughs> remains in him. He's not able to sin because he has been born of God. Now there's a question about um, what does it mean when John says his seed remains in him? What is his seed? There are different options and opinions. Um, I talked with some of the church members reading the Bible uh, this week. Some say that his seed is referring to God's word. Some say that his seed is referring to the Holy Spirit. Some say that the seed is referring to Jesus because Genesis 3.15. <clears throat> but to move on quickly, I'd say his seed is referring to his new nature, divine nature. Divine nature that's been imparted to the believer, which works nicely with 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. If you want to read that later, you can. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. I'd say his seed is referring to the new nature, the divine nature. And the reason why I think that is because <clears throat> of the Greek word seed. The Greek word for seed is sperma. Um, there's a natural parallelism, parallelism with human reproduction, semen, that is too strong, that matches well with the idea of being born of God. So I think his seed there is God's nature being given his divine nature indwelling, filling, 
the mankind or Christian now sharing in that divine nature. So those who are born of God has been given a new nature, a divine nature. That's the reason why Christians don't sin and we are unable to sin. Now let's take two minutes to unpack this idea. This idea of, okay, John says by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that who, he who is born, born again, he who is born of God does not sin and he is unable to sin. What does that mean? There is a total of four options. First option, some people say that um, sinless perfectionism is achievable. When you become a Christian, you are able to be perfected in this side of the age. You're able to not sin. No sin completely. That's sinless perfectionism. Second option is glorification. So when John says he is unable to sin and he does not sin, he's not talking about presently, he's talking about the resurrection. After Christ returns, we do not sin. We are not able to sin. That's the second option. Third option is the most common one, which is you are not able to sin continually or habitually or unrepentantly. Those are three options. Now, if you're bold enough, let's take a poll here. Um, you, can, you can just, you don't need to make a case, you can just raise your hand and see where you're at. You can change your options later. So who thinks when it says, when it says he is unable to sin, he does not sin, it's talking about sinless perfectionism. Nobody, okay? What about glorification? It's talking about um, resurrection or after resurrection. Okay, I got a few hands. Great. What about the third option? We got, I got maybe five or six hands. Or seven hands, eight hands, uh, nine hands. Okay, no more counting here. <laughs> what about the third option? Uh, that sin there is not sinning continually, habitually, or unrepentantly. Raise your hand. Ooh, I think maybe the majority of you. Okay, how many of you think there is a different option here? Some of you. There is four. Uh, yes. So option four is in one sense, Christians can't sin. Now, what does it mean in one sense, Christians can't sin? The word able and can aren't blanket statements of ontological impossibility. Now let me give you an example to unpack that idea. I'm gonna use the word can't in two different sentences and think about how the word can't is used in those two sentences. First sentence, humans can't survive without oxygen. That's a physical impossibility. Humans can't survive without oxygen. Now consider the second sentence. My boys, Ezra and Isaiah, can't hit their sister. What do I mean when I say Ezra and Isaiah can't hit my baby girl, Leah? I'm not talking about physical impossibility because yes, for sure Ezra and Isaiah can hit their baby sister. I've seen that. But I am talking about something that, that goes against their manhood. They're not men yet, but I am teaching them to be men. It goes against their nature to hit a female. So I'm saying, Ezra and Isaiah, you can't hit your sister. In other words, John here in the text isn't talking about ontological impossibility of sinning. But he's talking about how, you, how it goes against your nature, divine nature, to sin. Let me give you a last example. Last example is the unthinkability. You don't have to imagine this. It's the unthinkability 
of me walking out of my house naked and coming to the gathering. Coming to Sunday gathering after I took a shower, coming here, streaking, I, I am unable to do that. I can't. But can I? I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the physical possibility sense, I can. Does that make sense? There is a, it is, it is possible in one sense, but in another sense, it is not possible. In the same way, when, when John says, you are unable to sin, he is saying, it's against who you are. Twice born people can't sin. You must not, you cannot, you will not, you do not sin, twice born people. That's against your nature. It makes no sense for those who's been born of God to sin. But the tension is still there. But Peter, we sin all the time. I mean, you just talked about your sins, how you sinned against your boys. But there is a force against it. There is a splash of ice cold bucket of water splashed onto me with that sentence, you cannot sin. You are not able to sin. John is interested in his people being holy. So he says two things. In chapter one, you, I mean, you, we know this. Those who say and claim that you have no sin, you make God a liar. That's in verse, first John chapter one. So we do sin. So it's not the impossibility of sin ontologically, but there is a hard stop, an emphatic stop with the statement, twice born people can't sin. That's it, you have to believe it. It makes no sense every time you sin. Christians, it makes no sense every time you sin because you have a new nature, because you are born of God. So those who have been born of God, and that's my, my position, that's the fourth option. In one sense, those who are born of God cannot sin. You are unable to sin in one sense. And this means that the division between the lineage of God and of the devil is obvious. Those who belong to Christ and those who don't belong to Christ, if you look at their life in span of 20 years, it's stark, the differences. It has to be stark. Having received a new nature, Christians, you are going to be a certain way. And that is going to undeniably distinguish you from the children of the devil. I mean, that's what it says in verse 10. <clears throat> I'm going to read that part. Verse 10 says, This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. In another translation, it says, They are obvious. How is it obvious? Whoever does not do what is right, who, whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. If you've been given a new nature, you do what is right. That is the reality of Christians. You do what is right because you have a new nature. Which means if you don't do what is right, you don't have a new nature. At least in one sense. So from your new nature, something just oozes out constantly. Let me conclude um, this message. I talked about the main goal, which is know that you are born of God. Um, there are those of you who may be struggling with sin, like myself. I mean, all of us are struggling with sin, but there are some of you who may be discouraged, feeling derailed, feeling sad and angered by your sin. The message from God's word today is know that you are born of God. 
Two ways, by remaining in him. Second way, by letting no one deceive you. Sinless Jesus came to take away your sins. And the division between the devil's children and, the, and God's children is obvious. It is obvious right now. And it will be obvious finally. But let me rephrase my points. Saints, yes, when you look at verse 28, eight of, in verse 28 of chapter 2, the command is there, remain in Him. But Christians, you will remain in Him. You will be confident in the appearance of Jesus. And you will be confirmed. And you will be conformed to His image. And you won't be finally deceived. And Jesus has taken away your sins. And He will finally take away your sins. And at the separation of goats and sheep, you will be with the rest of the sheep. Enjoying the marriage supper with Christ our Savior. So saints, know that you are born of God today. Let me close with a prayer. Father, we pray that you would do what you've promised to do with your word. That it never returns void. That it always accomplishes whatever you've set it to accomplish. To further harden people's hearts or to soften people's hearts. We pray that you would edify the body here. Build them up. Equip them to be better Bible readers. Fill them up. Fill us up with your spirit. Help us to know that we are born of you. We have a new nature that's been given. And how hopeful that makes us become. The fact that we have new nature. We don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. What can we worry about when we've been given new nature? In one sense, we cannot sin. We are unable to sin. And in one sense, when we do sin, we do have the atoning sacrifice. And you are faithful and right to forgive us of our sins because of this atoning sacrifice. Father, help us to see your glory from your word, even as we speak to each other prayerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.